I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the light. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher in a verse where they see me at my words, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church Trying to walk on my own But I'm wound up alone Now I'm making my way To the foot of the cross It's not a trophy For the winners It's a shelter for the sinners It is far where I belong Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can't depend on, to the faith that's in my heart. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they see me at my words, to the love I had at first. Oh, I wanna go to church. I wanna go to church. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we're going to play another song here. I, I know uh, it's 10 o'clock, but uh, just to give everybody a chance to get on, uh, time gets away from us sometimes. So it's sometimes it's, it's nice to um, uh, give everybody a few more minutes. So we're going to, we're going to continue our little playlist here and uh, have another song or two before we start. Okay. So let's, uh, let's do that. Thank you. 
to see your beauty. To find you in the place your glory wears. There is one day in your court. There is one day in your house. There is one day in your court. Thousands elsewhere. Oh, there is one day in your court. There is one day in your house. There is one day in your court. Thousands elsewhere. There is one day in your court. There is one day in your house. There is one day in your court. Thousands elsewhere. There is one day in your court. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit is water for my soul. My trust is full. I've tasted and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. To your heart. There is one day, better is one day, better is one day, thousands elsewhere. And better is one day, better is one day, better is one day, thousands elsewhere. There is one day, All right. Good morning. Good morning. We um, got some uh, good help from uh, Heather uh, giving me some guidance on creating a playlist. So uh, now I don't have to tell my device here, uh, my choir director over here on the side uh, electronically to play songs. So um, anyway, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Darlington Baptist Church, because uh, we know that a church is more than a brick and mortar building, but it's the body of Christ joined together to celebrate um, our king. <clears throat> and uh, speaking of which, today is Palm Sunday. So uh, we're going to talk, we're actually not going to talk about Palm Sunday today. We're going to continue our theme of uh, identity in Christ. We're going to talk a little bit about Peter, but before we get to that, we've got a few announcements, uh, some some uh, business to tend to. So first thing I want to say is um, <clears throat> we've decided to uh, uh, try out something new in our midweek service. Uh, we're going to try to do a Zoom meeting uh, it's uh, it's a free thing. I posted on the page. I want to say Thursday or Friday. I spoke with a couple of people of our public Facebook page also. And um, anyway, uh, basically what you've got to do is go to zoom.us and create an account. All you need is an email address and you create your own password. And uh, basically what, what we do is uh, it limits us to 40 minutes. Um, the free account is limited to 40 minutes. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do our Facebook Live like we normally do on our midweek service, which will be Thursday evening because um, <clears throat> we get better connectivity on Thursdays and Wednesdays. So Thursday evening, we'll do our Facebook Live uh, Bible study at 6.30, and that'll go for 30, maybe 35, 40 minutes. And then what we'll do is we'll take a break. 
uh, for a few moments and get everybody a chance to log into the Zoom meeting where it's a video web conference and we can have interactive discussions based on the questions that we have when our uh, Bible study. So that way we can have some interactive um, opportunities and have a group discussion instead of just listening to me talk for an hour. Um, I know how much everybody loves to hear me talk, but it would be better and more conducive if we had um, some interaction. So uh, we're gonna do that. We're gonna try this afternoon to do a Zoom meeting live, like a practice trial run, and we can do multiple trial runs as the week goes on before we get to Thursday evening. So, um, so people can get comfortable with how to uh, manipulate the controls and stuff like that. So it's a learning experience. We're still trying to uh, serve the Lord and, and minister to our people as effectively as possible. So bear with us as we try out new technologies and new things to help us be effective in doing just that. The next thing is, um, uh, <clears throat> it's good news. Um, some people, I hope everybody believes it's good news, but um, I took the past couple of weeks and uh, in the evenings, and I spent a lot of time a couple of weeks ago um, working on a website. So we now have a website, and um, I, I gave the uh, URL out to uh, a few people to give some constructive feedback and um, some people that don't go to church with us, some other pastors and some um, uh, a buddy of mine that does uh, some webmaster work. He's a software developer and a couple other another friend of mine in high school, um, a software engineer. So they, they looked at it because they're the computer people and I'm not that smart when it comes to that stuff. So we have a website. I posted it on our page in our group uh, yesterday evening. It is www.darlingtonbaptistnc for North Carolina dot org www.darlingtonbaptistnc.org. So if you want to go look at our site, please check it out. Um, uh, there's only, there's what well, are, if you have any suggestions for what you would think may improve the website, please let me know. Um, I'm amenable to listen to, to any suggestions. Just keep in, please keep in mind that not every suggestion can be taken because there's only so much ability that we have uh, in that website builder to um, make that happen. So, but please, by all means, please share your, uh, your concerns and your um, suggestions, and we'll do our best to make it happen. Um, as we talked earlier, our midweek service, we've shifted it to Thursday. Uh, Wednesday evening is a peak, peak time for um, church and, and people being on the internet for those reasons. So we've shifted our, our midweek service to Thursday. We may play around with that in weeks to come. We may move it to Tuesday instead. But as of right now, Thursday evening at 6.30 is going to be our midweek Bible study. And um, one last thing I wanted to mention, um, uh, Kathy is still reviewing um, the information for the online giving platform that we're going to try to implement. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll bring more information to that when, when, it, when we need to. But we are looking into being able to provide uh, an avenue for people to give that might not be here or may not want to mail a check or whatever to uh, or come to the church or whatever the case may be. So um, we're looking into that and I'll let you guys know as we we um, progress toward that uh, goal. So um, anyway, uh, let's pray together and uh, we'll have another another worship song uh, referencing the Lord and then um, we'll get into our message. So let's let's go to Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for today. We praise you for who you are. We praise you for what this day signifies, symbolizes, and represents. This, this day represents, a, as we celebrated, a triumphant entry into Jerusalem as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Unfortunately, those people back then don't, didn't recognize you throughout the week as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, or you wouldn't have been crucified. But we know that you were crucified to fulfill the prophecy so that you could... You could fulfill the law and resurrect on the third day and give us hope eternal that we can one day commune face to face with you and the Lord. We do thank you for your sacrifice and we praise you for it. We ask you that you take this time of worship and service to you today as an act of glory and worship to you. That we can edify each other, that we can lift each other up during this time as we commune together worshiping the Lord. So we praise you and we thank you for all that you blessed us with. And we pray that as we take a small portion of our time and our resources and give back to you, that it's a blessing, not only to you, but to us as well. We praise you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know that there's a couple of things going on. I know Uncle Walter, uh, his nurse, um, had to come in today at 10. So let's let's play another song to worship the Lord so that we can um, we can give them some time to wrap that up and uh, and be able to join us. OK, so let's uh, this is uh, to God be the glory.
have done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who revealed in his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gave that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Welcome to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Amen. Amen. One of my one of my favorite hymns. I, I think I have about 400 favorites. So uh, thanks for indulging, <clears throat> indulging me and, uh, and join us in worshiping our Lord today. So um, let's uh, let's get started in our um, our message. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 18 uh, verses 25 through 27 and in John chapter 21 verses 15 through 17. And uh, John chapter 18, starting in verse 25. Well, as you guys are turning there on your in your Bibles or you're flipping there in your iPod or iPad or Android or whatever other device you're using to <clears throat> read the word of God, as you're turning to John chapter 18, 25, I want to share with you a recap from last week. Uh, we've been we've been talking about identity in Christ for a few weeks now. And um uh, ironically, uh, God knows what he's doing and, and I don't, but I, I was wanting to preach a series on identity in Christ. And for some reason, for several weeks, I just, I couldn't put a sermon together. Um, and a few weeks ago, it happened that we were in second Peter, um, chapter one, verses three through nine. And we talked about identity in Christ. And last week we talked about, uh, Elijah and what it looks like to lose your identity in Christ. And, um, and what we had to do to uh, regain that we need to seek the Lord. And today we're going to have another example uh, from Peter. And um, we're going to learn a little bit about Peter and, and how not only how he rejected and denied Christ at, uh, well, he didn't reject him, but as he denied Christ, um, when Christ was uh, in his trials and such, we're going to, um, <clears throat> we're going to see how he was restored. We're going to see how he was restored to let us know that just because we may temporarily lose our identity in Christ, does not mean that we can't get it back. Does not mean that God loves us any less, as we talked about last week with Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. So today, as we, as we go to read, I, I want us to look at um, uh, the title of today's message is, um, it's, it's a funny story. The, the, the title of, of today's message um, is Good Initiative, Bad Judgment. And um, for all, all of my Marine friends out there, they're probably chuckling right now because uh, a friend of mine, uh, well, my twin brother was in the Marine Corps uh, for about 10 years or so. And 
a neighbor of mine was in the Marine Corps for four or five years. <clears throat> and in our conversations, some of the stories he tells me is a uh, good initiative, bad judgment. And a lot of times what happens is, is the reason we lose our identity in Christ is because we have great initiative. We just have bad judgment. And the fallout from that judgment, that decision that we've made is typically what causes us to lose or it reflects our loss of identity in Christ. So uh, one of the things about Elijah last week is Elijah had a, he was greatly depressed because of his loss of identity. And um, but why did he lose his identity? Well, he lost his identity because he feared losing his life. He feared what man could do to him instead of rejoicing with what God could do for him. Now, keep in mind, he had just conquered the uh, prophets of Baal on, the, on Mount Carmel, and 4,500 people were slain by the, by the nation of Israel, for, and they went back to worshiping the true God. And he had that experience, and he prayed for rain to come, and rain started coming, and then he fears Jezebel's threat all of a sudden. He worships the Most High God, and he feared Jezebel's threat. So he ran away, and he sought God. He went to Mount Horeb there uh, by, by the Sinai Peninsula, he traveled all the way from Israel, Mount Carmel, all the way down there. And along the way, he was fed by, by an angel of the Lord twice and given water and food to drink there. And, and he went to the mountain of God and Mount, and God asked him, why was he here? Twice, he asked him, why was he there? See, what, what, what happened is he took his eyes off of God momentarily and looked at the world. And then the second thing that happened is, is he lost track of his assignment. He lost track of his assi assignment. He had good initiative, but bad judgment. So today we're going to talk a little bit about good initiative and bad judgment. And if we look at, at uh, the, the Gospel of John, is he's referred to as the disciple that Jesus loved. And to keep in mind, the Gospel of John was written in a unique time. It was written well a, a, a long period after the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was written a while past that, and um, several years, if you will, a couple of decades even. And, um, and he writes this, this Gospel. John's Gospel is not necessarily in chronological order. It, it is an order that explains the deity of Christ. Um, and that's significant. If you ever have a chance to read the Gospel of John, you'll see that in comparison with the other uh, Gospels, it's, it's focused more on the deity of, of Christ. And, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, and uh, anyway, it, because it focuses on the deity of Christ, it's not necessarily in chronological order, but it's in the order to, I'm, I'm trying to think of the words, and I apologize for, for, for fumbling and stuttering here. Um, the best way to explain it is John builds the case for Christ's deity step by step, even if that means he, he gets the, the, or, the order of events wrong. He uses the events to prove Christ's deity as it, as it pinnacles and culminates on his uh, death at Calvary. So that, that's what John's goal is. So, so right now in John chapter 18, verse 25, and I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible, and, and your Bible translation may be a little different, but I promise you, it's the Word of God. It says, Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. And now if you'll turn a, a page or so over, and we'll, we're going to read that those, those three verses in John chapter 21. John chapter 21, starting in verse 15. Starting in verse 15. He says, So when they had finished break, uh, breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we, as we read these words uh, from the, the uh, disciple John and the Gospel of John and his, his message to us, we see, we see a unique parallel that 
Peter denies Jesus three times, and Jesus asks him three times if he loves him. There are a couple other parallels we're going to get into today, but I pray that the words that come out of my mouth today, as I go through the outline and I, I, I preach the word of God to your people and to those watching, I, 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 I pray that it's the message you would have them to hear. That it's a message that, that uh, rebukes and exhorts, encourages, lifts up, and edifies the body of Christ. Because we need all of it. We don't need to just feel good all the time. We need to be challenged where we're at. We need to be challenged to rethink our decision-making abilities. But we also need to be encouraged and lifted up. Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can cut us to the quick, but it can also be used to defend us and strengthen us and encourage us. So I pray that that's what this message does today on the day that we celebrate our King, Jesus Christ. I pray that that's what the word of God does today for all of us watching and to me giving a message. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's let's look here as uh, as we as we go through our passage. So. Uh, we have to understand a little bit about Peter before we before we dive into that. And I know a lot of you may know who Peter is and, and know um, what Peter was like. So we're we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, about Peter uh, today. And uh, the personality Peter had was Peter was confident, bold, and and some say he was arrogant. In John chapter thirteen, verse thirty seven, Peter says uh, that he would not deny. Excuse me. I'm sorry, I got, got distracted. Peter says that he wanted to follow Jesus and he would lay his life down for him. The exact verse says, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered and said, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. So what we, what we see here is he was a confident, bold person. In fact, um, <clears throat> Peter knew who Jesus was. He was the first one, according to the Gospel of John, to, to, to publicly admit who Christ was. In John chapter 6, verse 68, he says, uh, Jesus is asking um, his disciples who they say he is. Si and it says, and, and Simon Peter says, and answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter knew who Jesus was. Peter knew what he was supposed to do. Peter even was so zealous that he, he cut off the, uh, the ear of the, slave of the a slave of the high priest when they went to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had good initiative, but bad judgment. His bad judgment was when he denied Christ. So the Lord was arrested in John chapter 18, verse 4 through 11. And you can see that the, the, Jesus knew what they were coming to do. His disciples really didn't, but he, Jesus knew. Jesus had been preparing them and telling them this whole time that he was going to be arrested. He was going to be crucified. He was going to die for their sins. But yet, for some reason, they just, just couldn't get it. So... Peter, like Elijah last week, was scared of death. He was afraid. He was afraid. You know, the Bible tells us that we should not be afraid. We've actually quoted 1 Timothy, where Paul tells Timothy that we have not been given a spirit of fear or a spirit of timidity. We haven't been during this pandemic and this virus, but many people have lost their identity in Christ because of the virus, because of the pandemic that we're suffering. You know why people have lost their uh, identity in Christ? Because they've lost their job. They have income is not coming in like it once was. They've lost their ability to provide for their family. So now they struggle and they fail and they fall short because they've found, now they're learning that they've actually found their identity in something other than God. And that's why they're struggling. And I know many would look at me and say, well, that's easy for you to say, Justin. You're uh, an essential employee. I have to go to work. I could probably have to go to work during a nuclear holocaust. Because if the railroad shuts down, we have bigger problems than a pandemic. And that's true. You know, I, I do get to look at it from rose-colored glasses. 
But there have been many times in the past where I didn't know where my next check was going to come from, believe it or not. When I was in the military and some things happened, and, and that's not the point of the message today, so we won't go into it. But I've been there where the military gave me an advanced debt so I could have a paycheck. So I was indebted to Uncle Sam so I could have a paycheck and put food on the table. So I've been there where I didn't have a paycheck. When I separated from the military, I had an, I had an issue that I, I had a hard time finding a job at the end of 2008. And, and I was depressed because I lost my identity in Jesus Christ. I was prideful. I didn't even want to go to the unemployment office and collect unemployment because I was too prideful because I didn't believe that that was for me. So I've been in those places where I didn't have a paycheck. I've been in those places where I, I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from at times. But one thing stayed strong with me, and that's in that God provides. God always provides. See, Peter feared persecution. He feared the authorities. He didn't know where he was going to go. He was lost. He was like a, a, a sheep without a shepherd. He was like a, a boat without a sail. He didn't know where he was going to go. He was afraid for his master, his Lord, and his Savior. And instead of publicly admitting who Christ was, he denied him three times. What we have to understand, and what everybody in the world needs to understand, regardless of their denominational affiliation, Peter is human. He is not the vicar of Jesus Christ, as some would say. And some denominations elevate Peter to a to a uh, a deity type level. That's not that's not the case. Peter's fallible, and so are we. We have to realize that we're all, we are we are all humans. We're not perfect, and the worst thing we can do is compare ourselves to somebody else. That is the utmost worst thing we could do, because we don't know where that person's struggles are. We don't know what that person has or doesn't have. And the more we compare to other people, we begin to elevate and put them on a pedestal, and they take the place of Jesus Christ in our lives. That's how we can lose our identity. See, when we, when we want to compare us to someone else, when we don't know their circumstances, we don't know where they're at in their life, we don't know what they might be struggling with or what they may be successful in, when we compare ourselves to other people, we open up the door for sin. Because Satan's Satan being the author of confusion wants us to do just that. Because the more we put our eyes on someone else, we either don't want to be like him or we don't want to act like that person or we don't want to do this like that person or we want to have what they have. All we're doing is focusing on them and taking our focus off of Jesus Christ. But that's what we do sometimes. And, and as, we, as we turn a couple pages over to John chapter 21, um, we're going to finish here with, with, with Peter. One of the key things that we have to understand here is, as we prepare to go to the next part of our passage, our message here, one of the key things we've got to understand about Peter is that he is similar to us and that he lives in a fallen, sinful world. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, there's been a curse on the earth. Sin has been in in, in the world, in and about the world, the, the Bible says, uh, Peter himself says that uh, the, the, the devil, the adversary, the evil one, roams around like a ravenous lion seeking whom he may devour. And another part of the scriptures, it says that Satan is the prince of this world. He's been given dominion over the earth because we allowed, we as he, the human race, allowed sin into the world. So a fallen world challenges our faith. Even someone that has the best intentions can fall and stumble. I'm your pastor and I'm a human being and I fail and I stumble. I struggle with things. Sometimes I struggle with uh, pride. Sometimes I struggle with, sometimes I struggle with being too modest and too humble. Sometimes I struggle with, with uh, losing my patience. Sometimes I struggle with being irritated too easily. I'm not long suffering. I'm not gentle. I'm not meek. I struggle with all these things because I live in a fallen sinful world and I'm a fallen human being. And it's only when I take my eyes off of Jesus Christ is when I start to struggle the more. That's why I have an accountability partner. That's why I pray regularly. That's why I read my word. So because if I spend time with Jesus, I notice that my days go a whole lot smoother than if I don't. You know, <clears throat> one of the things we have to do when we lose our identity in Christ, and, and we're going we're gonna to get to John 21 here in a second. One of the things we have to do when we realize that we lose our identity in Christ is, one, we have to realize it. We have to be willing to admit that our 
identity is no longer found in Christ, but found in something else. We've idolized something else, whether it be money, resources, or whatever. We have to be repentant. Repentance literally means, literally, to turn away from. So we have to repent from our evilness, our wicked ways. We have to repent from turning away from God. And when we repent, we actually turn back to God. We have to have a heart of contrition, as uh, King David did in Psalm chapter 51, 17. He even says, you don't want offerings and burnt offerings. You want a, a broken, contrite heart, a broken, contrite spirit. Those are the things that the Lord wants. So we have to turn from our wickedness, which means we're seeking a new direction. And the new direction we need to seek is to follow Jesus Christ. We also need to seek forgiveness. See, part of repentance is seeking forgiveness. And this, this same guy, John, who wrote this book, he wrote a letter in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How about that? The guy that we turn our back on, when we come back to him, is willing to not only forgive us and remove all our iniquity, excuse me, but he forgives us. He forgives us like it never happened. How about that? An eternal father, a king, a high priest, our Lord, he takes us back. How many of us can do the same? How many of us have great initiative and bad judgment? How many of us have the great initiative to want to be like Christ, to have this strong desire to be like Jesus Christ, to, to desire to not only be like him, but to act like him and, and to praise him and worship him, but in our own lives, we fall short and we fail in forgiving other people. We hold a grudge. Perhaps maybe we don't see eye to eye with someone. And then instead of, instead of forgiving that person, we hold that resentment and that grudge. So we must seek forgiveness. You know, if, if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord from the mouth, it reflects a condition of our heart. Well, the same thing is when we have a sinful heart, we need to confess our sins to Jesus. We have to confess because we've made the decision in our heart that we know that we're wrong and now we're seeking repentance and forgiveness. We also need to check our commitment. This is where we're going to get to, and uh, this is where we're going to get to as we move to John chapter twenty-one here in a few moments. Are we fully committed? See, Peter, believe it or not, wasn't fully committed. Had he been fully committed? He wouldn't have denied Jesus three times. In fact, he said, as we read earlier, that he said he was willing to die for Jesus Christ. So if he was fully committed, he wouldn't have denied Jesus because he would have been prepared to fulfill the promise that he made to him. You know, we have to count the cost. Discipleship in Jesus with Jesus Christ is, is, is expensive. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25 and going to verse 33, talks about, talks about the cost of discipleship. See, claiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is one thing. Following Jesus is something completely different. If we confess Jesus Christ with our mouth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that, uh, you know, we're saved because confession comes from the mouth, which is a reflection of the heart. And I'm not going to argue that because I believe that. But if we truly confess Christ as Lord and Savior, he's our Lord, that means we seek to follow him. And the cost of discipleship is expensive. Discipleship in Christ will always cost us something, whether it's friends, maybe a job, maybe family. Discipleship following Jesus can cost us a lot on this earth but it's nothing compared to what we gain in heaven. You know, look at the rich young ruler, the parable of the rich young ruler. He had everything. So he comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher, rabbi, good teacher. What must I do to go to heaven? And he asked, Jesus asked him why he calls him good. And 
they have a conversation and he says, uh, well, keep the commandments. And he said, I've done all those. And he says, go and sell all your possessions and come and follow me. And the guy walked away deeply grieved, grieved. We're going to come to that word again here in a second. He walked away deeply grieved because he had many possessions. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and he said, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for the camel to go through the eye of a needle. The reason that is, is because what we do is we find our identity in what we have instead of trusting in Jesus. The biggest thing that discipleship with Jesus Christ cost us is the illusion of control. We have to give up control because we have to realize that we're not in control of anything. In reality, well, we don't have control over anything. We think we do, and we can control little things in our lives, at least we think we can. But in reality, we can't control anything because there's only two things guaranteed while we're alive on this earth. If you're alive, you're going to die, and you're going to pay taxes. Simple as that. Those are the only two, two things guaranteed. You're not guaranteed to, to get rich and stay rich. You're not guaranteed to, go, to, to be poor and stay poor. <laughs> you're, you're not guaranteed anything. So Peter had good initiative, but he had bad judgment because he denied Christ. He suffers great regret and depression, and he basically exemplifies a lack of sincerity and a lack of commitment. So now we can get to chapter, John chapter 21, verse 15 and 17, and um, we, can, we can read that read that one more time. It says, and this is, this is John chapter 21, verses 15 and 17. It says, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my, tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. See, what we have to do is one of the things that repentance and confession and being forgiven makes us do is it makes us face our sin. And that's what Jesus is doing to Peter in this small passage of Scripture. Jesus is addressing Peter's sin without blatantly addressing it. See, Peter's denial is a sore subject because Peter's ashamed. You know, sinfulness causes us to be ashamed because we've disappointed God, as it should. But what we have to understand is that there's no more shame in Christ Jesus. There's no more shame. Romans 8.1 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. But our sin can be a sore subject. More so because we're afraid of what people may say than what God may say. That's sad. We're more afraid of people than we are of God. Should be the other way around. Anyway, addressing sin. You cannot be restored without the acknowledgement of past failures. You cannot be restored without the acknowledgement of past failures. So Jesus' three, three questions highlighted Peter's arrogance. He wanted to be the most loving disciple. He wanted to be the most dedicated disciple. He, he was the only one who said, I'm gonna, I'll die for you, Jesus. And we find out that he, when he had the chance to put his money where his mouth was, he failed. Good initiative, bad judgment. It brought to light his sinful pride. You know, Solomon, the wisest man to ever walk the earth, is what the Bible tells us. The wisest man. He compiled a book of wise Proverbs, and he entitled it Proverbs. And a, por a large portion of that book he's credited with authoring, but he compiled this large book of wise sayings. And one of the things in that book says, pride goeth before the fall. Pride goes, or a haughty spirit goes before the fall, depending on your translation. Proverbs 16, 18. Peter's pride had to go before his fall. You like that? His pride had to go before his fall. And because of his pride, because of his pridefulness and his arrogance, he had good initiative, but he made a bad judgment. The context of questions was Jesus, uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. 
So Jesus asks about his love commitment three times. Every time he says, do you love me? I'm not going to get into the semantics of phylos and, and agape love because I don't, I don't necessarily uh, agree with, with the word. that they're, they're, they're used synonymously throughout the, whole, throughout the whole book of John. So we're not going to get into that because I don't think it's as pertinent as the fact that when you say, do you love someone? Are you fully committed to them? Are you fully committed? So basically when he says, do you love me? He's asking Peter if he's committed. And Peter, as we all would, when you're asked the first time, yeah, Jesus, you know I love you. And the second time, yeah, yeah, you know I love you. But when you gotta ask somebody three times, that makes you think, well, then maybe they don't believe me. Maybe they don't believe me. Or maybe what I've done is causing them not to believe me. That's like when I tell Lisa I love her. We, you know, we have a habit, a ritual, a, a, a ritualistic behavior. When, when, and I don't. Everybody probably does, but I know we do. I can't speak to what you do, but I can speak to what I do. And every time I leave the house, I say I love you. Every time I'm on the phone with her, and I, before I hang up, I say I love you. But what does love really mean? Biblical love is self-sacrificing devotion to someone else. That's what love means. So basically, every time I say I love you, I might as well have a long novel and say, I am deeply cherishing you and will serve you and will never let anything come before me, devoting myself and sacrificing myself to you. Bye. That's basically what I'm saying. I'm fully committed to you. I'm using a one word to demonstrate all that. So Jesus is basically asking Peter the same thing three times. Are you deeply committed and devoted to me in service? And G Peter says, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Then the second time, he's asking the same thing. Yeah, 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 I'm good. And then the third time, I says, Peter was deeply grieved. The word lupeo is conjugated in that sentence as Greek, lupeo, and it means deep sadness or emotional distress. Peter was deeply emotionally distressed because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? As he should have been. Think about it. If you, if, 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 <laughs> I'll use this example. Some of you may be proud to deny that you know me, and that's fine. Uh, but if, if someone was to ask you, hey, you know that preacher there at Darlington, Justin Carp? You're like, I don't know who that guy is. I don't claim him. And then another person asks you, and you told them the same thing, and the third person asks you. And then a couple of weeks, a couple of days, a couple of weeks later, you come up to me and you say, hey, man, I love you. Do you really? You, you denied that you knew me. I'd be pretty hurt. And then, and then if I asked you, do you love me three times, you'd probably be pretty hurt too because the conviction of your sin would eat at you. And I'm just a human being. Imagine if Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, come up to you and said, do you love me? And your whole life, ever since you've become a Christian, has been filled with examples of how you don't live a Christian life, how you don't, you don't regard Christ as Lord and Savior. You don't practice what you preach. Your whole life is one thing, but you live a different way outside of church. How would that make you look when Jesus looks at you and says, do you love me? Oh, yeah, Lord, I love you. Yeah, you're praising me with your lips, but you're giving him a lip service. You're not doing what he's called you to do. That's what, that's what the context of this passage is saying to us. That's why Jesus asked him three times, and he was deeply grieved, as we should all be deeply grieved. If Jesus came to me today and said, do you love me? I'd be deeply grieved because I would probably, I'd probably say, no, I don't act like it. I don't act like it. Sometimes I do, but a lot of times I don't. That's the sad, that, that's where we have to repent. He showed a lack of sincerity and, and, or, and or commitment from his earlier statements and boasts because he denied Jesus three times. But at the end, he says, you know all things, you know that I love you. He pleaded to Jesus's omniscience and says, you know all things, you know that I love you. See, the thing is with Peter, is Peter's faith didn't fail. His courage did. His courage did. Sometimes our faith is stronger than our courage. We may believe wholeheartedly in something, but we're afraid to act. Good initiative, bad judgment. So I have a couple questions, application moments to our uh, passage passages today. Are we sincere? Do we love God? Are we sincerely loving God? Is a better way to ask that question. To combine those two into one. Do we do we sincerely 
love God. If Christ were to come today, right now, and we heard the trumpet call, what's the first thought that's going to come into our mind? Would we be excited? I'm getting out of here. Or would we be scared, worried, or convicted about sin that was in our life or the lifestyle that we have chosen to live? To live? Would we welcome Jesus with open arms or would we say, hey, hold on a second. I, I, I got to go fix some things in my life because I've messed up for the past 5, 10, 15 years. Let me, let me get that straight so you can come back and we can redo it. You don't get a mulligan. If the lifestyle you're living right now is not pleasing to the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then you need to fix it now. Now is the time to fix it. Not, not when he comes. It's too late. How about this one? Do we walk in our life with multiple identities? Do we have a multiple personality disorder? And I know that might be humorous, but hear me out. Do we have a multiple personality disorder? Do we worship idols? I don't mean the little statues, you know, I don't mean those. What I mean is, do we worship things other than Jesus Christ? Because if we worship anything other than Jesus Christ, if we find our identity in things other than Jesus Christ, then we failed. We failed. Because if we walk one way on Sunday and Wednesday and any other day we go to church, and the rest of the time we, 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 ref, we reflect a different life, then we don't find our identity in Jesus. We find our identity in our pride and other things that this world has to offer. So identity in Christ requires two things. Two things. Complete submission and or surrender to him and complete trust in him. Complete submission and or surrender to him. Submission and surrender are kind of synonymous terms and complete trust in him. So I ask you today, today, I know I'm not fit. We're not all physically there, and, and but we're going to do a, a hymn of invitation like we always do so we can reflect and meditate. And if you want to make a decision, call me. And if you don't have my number, go to my Facebook page, shoot me a Facebook message, email me, go to our website. There's a way to contact me on there. Find a way to contact me or I will contact you. Put in the comments you want to talk to me on our, on our, our video. We'll, we'll, we will talk to you about Jesus Christ. I promise you that because nothing's more important in your life than salvation through Christ. And similar to last week, one of the few songs that I know on the piano, I'm going to go play, play us a, a, a hymn. So bear with me. If the house is a mess, don't, 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 don't get mad at Lisa. But we're going to try to play I Surrender All for our, uh, our, our hymn of invitation. And uh, last week we kind of stumbled through uh, just as I am. So this week I, I practiced this morning before church. So hopefully it'll, it'll go smoothly. But, but I want us, to, I want us to, to trust and surrender ourselves to God. So let's, uh, let's join with me as we worship our Lord and we, we sing a song together. I can't do two things at once, so I can't sing this but, uh, while I play. But you guys sing to yourselves as we, we go through this.
to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Now I'm going to go back over to our table, and I'm going to, as, as we're closing out our service today, uh, we're going to pray, and we're going to, uh, we're going to pray, and, and then I'm going to play a song as, as we all log off and stuff like that, so we can kind of meditate a little bit more, but um, uh, it, we, we want to thank all of you for, for coming today. All the other things you could be doing, I know it's not a lot, we can't go anywhere, but all the other things you could be doing, watching TV or whatever, you're deciding to worship the Lord in song and the exhortation of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And that's something to build our repertoire of tools we have to defend, the, defend us against the evil one. Let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you and we love you. We praise you. We ask you that this, the words that were spoken today they do two things. They can The Holy Spirit uses them to convict, and the Holy Spirit uses them to encourage. Because where there's conviction of sin, there's hope in Christ Jesus that we can be, we can be forgiven of that sin, and we can have repentance in our lives, and we can go forth and we can follow Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. For those people that don't know Jesus Christ, we've offered them an eternal hope that there's something we can do with the sinfulness in our lives. We can turn to Jesus. And we can be renewed and be born again. We ask you that as we go through today, we go through this week, that you lift us up, Holy Spirit. You encourage us and you strengthen us so that we make the right decisions. That instead of having good initiative, bad judgment, we have good initiative and good judgment. We thank you for this today. We ask a blessing on our people and all of our audience today. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we go, we have another, another song we're going to sing, we're going to listen to. To all, all hail the power of Jesus' name by uh, Shane and Shane. As we're using this this time to to um, go our separate ways, I pray the good Lord blesses you, he keeps you safe this week, he lifts up his countenance upon you, and he gives you a peace. You guys have a uh, wonderful week, 
And uh, we look forward to seeing you again midweek service on Zoom when we do our interactive uh, question and answer period for our Bible study. Be blessed. Bye-bye.